Sorry, I didn't mute myself. Welcome, friends and fans, to another episode of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. Today, we'll be going back to your childhood, which cast members from several Disney classics, and now's the time for all of you in our chat room to begin typing in your questions for them. Immediately after this session, you will have the opportunity to talk to them directly through our private chat options, as well as purchasing autographs and personalized video recordings, all of which are available right now at GalaxyCon.com. So without further ado, let's bring out today's guests. First, he is an actor whose body of work includes How to Eat Fried Worms, Supernatural, and Weeds. Today, he joins us to discuss his Disney roles as the title characters of Finding Nemo and Bambi and the Great Prince of the Forest. Please welcome Alexander Gould. Hi. <clears throat> thanks hey. so much for having me. Hey, thanks for having us here, boss. Uh, here hope, hope everything is well in your part of the world. It is. I'm out in Los Angeles, and uh, it's kind of quiet still, but things are slowly reopening and, and everything's everything's doing well so absolutely yeah. very cool next she is an actress whose credits include runaway bride the twisted tales of felix the cat today she joins us as the speaking voice of princess jasmine from aladdin please welcome the lovely linda larkin hey everyone hello how are you young lady i'm doing great thank you i'm coming to you from miami beach so it's a little later here where I am than where Alexander is. Oh my, oh my. So we're so, so glad to have you here. And next, he is an actor whose body of work includes the Brady Bunch movies, Starman, and Malcolm and Eddie. Today he joins us with the role of Prince, the voice of Prince Eric in the original Little Mermaid. And because of Disney's acquisition of Marvel Comics, his roles as the voice of Spider-Man in the 1994 animated series and subsequent returns as Spider-Man Noir, Spider-Man 29, and Electro and the Ultimate Spider-Man are now on today's table. Please welcome Christopher Daniel Barnes. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Hey. Good, boss. How are you today? I'm great. Glad to be here. I'm not wearing a mask, so that makes me happy. I'm inside. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. We have all we have we had this is then again, this this has been the curious advantage to it. We obviously we miss having you on our stages and in front of getting you in front of your audiences, but uh until then, we are so glad to have you here in our virtual stage. So thank you all for joining us again today. Uh what I would like to know and let our audience know is where did this uh, Disney journey begin for each of you? And I guess Steve, it probably starts with you if we go chronologically with the Little Mermaid. Uh, well, let's see. I was uh, 15 years old at the time. I was doing a television series called Day by Day, and uh, I auditioned for it just like you know any other guy. Um, nowadays, you, you probably wouldn't do that. Everything's you know big celebrities and packaged for the most part. Uh, but back then, it, it wasn't that way. I mean, the, uh, the the movie before that was like The Great Mouse Detective, which by the way is one of my all-time favorites. Radigan is like one of my favorite villains. That's a good one. Um, but it wasn't the you know multi bazillion dollar franchise that it that it then became. So. Little guys like me were able to go in there and audition, and uh, you know, I uh, I got the job, and I was I was only fifteen when I did it. So now I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! What were uh, what were some of the challenges? Of that because again, that was the early day, and that might have was that analog you were recording off of actual tapes. I I think it was the first. Uh, let's see. I I I'm, yeah, because I don't think they had anything like they have today. I mean, certainly not. I think it was the last one that used actual cells, like the the. Yeah, you know, yeah, well, it, yeah. It was a, it was a cell production? I'm just curious. From the audio recording, though, I was wondering if you actually had to work with. Okay, we're we'll do another take. Exactly, and uh, this was the first time I think they were using cameras uh, to uh, video the uh, voiceover actors doing their thing, and they yeah. weren't going to get into the uh, into the illustrations. It was pretty amazing to to see that. I mean, it was you know so long ago, but I remember thinking, oh, look, there's a video camera set up there, and then when, when I saw the movie, I was thinking. My family would say, wait, that's an expression just like you do. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool because they were videoing it. And it was the dawn of a new era. It was very interesting. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It was just, that was the custom. It was Oliver and Company kind of put Disney animation kind of back on the map. And then Little Mermaid cemented it. And then Beauty and the Beast basically set the stage for awesome. the, <laughs> the, what we enjoy today. And the next person on that stage, Linda, my dear, Aladdin. Yes. Yes. So Two movies later, after The Little Mermaid, Aladdin came along. So Beauty and the Beast was being made while I auditioned for Aladdin. So I'd seen The Little Mermaid, didn't know anything about Beauty and the Beast yet. Um, while I was recording Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast came out and I was like, oh, I think we're part of something really huge here. It wasn't until that moment when I realized this was a renaissance of Disney feature animation. 
So, you know, we, we didn't know much. Like Christopher said, I went in, a friend of mine drove me to Burbank because she had the audition too. So she picked me up and she was super like high tech fancy. She had a fax machine. <laughs> so, she got, so she got the sides. She got the scene that we were reading faxed to her the night before. So she was able to study it the night before, but I studied it in the car on the way to the audition because she was driving and I was the passenger. And when we got to Burbank to the studio, it was the tiniest room. It was just the casting director, a little tape recorder. I don't know if it was the analog or it was like yeah. cassette tape, but it was a microphone, a music stand, and a room probably the size of most people's bathrooms. And, you know, soundproof. I recorded the scenes. I left and I didn't hear anything for probably a month. And I was like, oh, well, I thought that went well, but who knows what they're looking for. Uh, you know, I kind of didn't think much about it. And they called and they said, they want you to come in and do more. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay. So that's how my journey began. And then <clears throat> for two years, we were in the recording studio. Um, wow. You know, sometimes a month would go by, sometimes a couple months would go by, but over the course of two years, okay. Yeah, and that was uh, that was very much of the time uh, for for your your projects. They come on in, do stuff, and I imagine your there were scenes that were rewritten that you uh, you you had to come back in. Do we do the scene before? Yeah, we changed the script. Were there were there moments like that? Absolutely, we would we would have things that were rewritten. We would have in my case a lot of things were added for my character. So when they first were casting for Princess Jasmine, she was really a secondary character mm -hmm. and the movie is really about the genie and about Aladdin you know it, it not like Beauty and the Beast that was the title character that princess and the Little Mermaid that was the title character Jasmine was the girlfriend she was you know a secondary character but they kept expanding her role which was really the right thing to do it was right. so great how ahead of their time they were making that movie and they kept expanding Jasmine and making her a stronger and stronger character. And and then they added a song, which I was like, oh, I guess that's the end of me doing Jasmine. It was fun, but I'm not a singer. They didn't cast me as a singer. They wanted actresses who were good with comedy. That was, that was the specs that went out. Uh, and I was like, oh boy. They said, do you sing? And I was like, not like a princess. I, it's been nice knowing you guys and they're like no 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 we're gonna try this thing we're gonna we're gonna have someone sing for you we're doing it already for aladdin yeah. so it's it's not such a huge jump we're gonna we're gonna bring someone in and we feel like we can really match your speaking voice well and they did it so perfectly and seamlessly that i think i even believed i could sing <laughs> and uh, you, you are certainly not alone in that. So many uh, Disney Disney characters have had separate talents for the singing and speaking category. Uh, well, we were the first. Yes, you were. Yes, no, you were the first time you, you explained it. You uh, said I think I'm the only Disney prince who doesn't sing. I think I'd like to mention that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no song here, baby. Yeah, you're the, you're the guy, man. You got you got the chest and the looks. You don't need to sing. You just right. here. Uh, so we have these wonderful characters. Let's flash ahead to the future. Alexander, uh, yeah. you came. How did you come on board? And what was the experience like? Since we could say the technology got a little advanced. Yeah, so definitely super advanced. Um, I found it interesting to hear Christopher talking about uh, how back in the day it was easy to just go and get get a role and audition like anyone else. Um, I think I might have been one of the last people to do that. Um, and I think it was only because I was uh, young and they were looking specifically for a kid to play the role. Um, so I auditioned for the role of Nemo. Um, I think actually to place it in time, it was like, two weeks after 9-11 happened. So the world was a little bit wild, a little bit crazy. Um, and I was six years old. Um, and I think I have you you beaten in time, Linda, a little bit, because I waited about a year until I heard anything back. 
No way. Yeah. Wow. So it was, um, I, I auditioned and then, you know, I was going on auditions. I was a kid. I was acting in many different things and it was just one of the many and um, didn't hear anything. And then a year later, they called me in again. I went in again, like you said, um, it's a very small room. It might've been the same building up in Burbank, the one with a big, big hat on it. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, if anyone's been to Burbank, you'll see it off the freeway. And uh it, it was a it was a small room and a couple people. I think the director Andrew Andrew Stanton was there, and they had me read it, read you know the couple scenes that they had me read, and um, I I did it. And then again, didn't hear anything. It was like okay, just another audition. About a month later, they called me back. I went back into that I think the same studio, and they said you have the part, but I didn't even really know what the part was. Really didn't really know. There's a few other kids there who were reading some of the other kid roles in, in the film. And we were like, oh yeah, what role is he playing? And they were like, oh, Nemo. And we were like, wait, the title character. And that was, it was surprising and exciting. And um, again, I was only like six or seven at the time. So it was, for me, it was overwhelming a little bit. It was a, a big process to, um, have to continuously go back into the studio and um, yeah. do it over time. But yeah, the technology was, was hugely different. It's um, interesting, isn't it? That the, uh, uh, we, we all sort of talked about the, the confinement of the booth and, and the space. A lot of people don't realize that. And I, a lot of people, you know, they'll ask you, or at least they'll ask me with uh, like Spider-Man, especially about these sort of like epic battle scenes or, or in the movie, the Disney movies, the, these, you know, incredible, you know, vast, you know, things are going on. And, they don't realize that you, we're, we're just in like a little phone booth, like with our eyes closed, <laughs> yeah. our heads, trying to put that, you know, visualization into our voices because, you know, we're in a little soundproof, you know, tomb. <laughs> trying to bring life to it. So it's interesting that we, that you guys both mentioned the, the size of the booth because it's so yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the did, scope of the films is so huge. Exactly. But the size of the room that we're making them in is- right. it's this epic point oh. here. And yeah. we're just like sitting there with our eyes closed. <laughs> Bigger on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What one thing? One thing that that, that uh, the general public still thinks of when they think of uh, developing animation, but they th they still think that it's a radio show style. That the entire cast is all there, each on a microphone, each on their cans, and Disney kind of feeds into that because it seems like. At one point, they bring in some of the principals to do do a mock scene of them all recording together to sort of uh, create that. So, what, did, did that happen well, to any, to any we, point? We did. So, we recorded in our film everything solo, and then we recorded everything with the people we were in the scenes with. Okay. So, one of the the biggest questions that I get asked is, "Did I work with Robin Williams?" And happily, I did and i don't think if i had done that movie two movies earlier i probably wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to work with robin i believe page's cast beauty and the beast was the first cast that they brought the actors in the room together is that right christopher did you guys work together on little mermaid no i didn't right. work with anyone on little mermaid but okay. it's funny to say the uh, the radio show because spider-man was that way we oh. were 15 people in the booth, all, it was like an old radio show. It was just like oh, that. Wow. With mm -hmm. Disney stuff, it completely isolated. And the video yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I mean, what was different was the um, animated series. When we did the Aladdin cartoon series for two years, there you that go. was like a radio play. We were all in the room together when we were all in Los Angeles together. Yeah, and, that's interesting. Yeah, and then, you know, we would get to do I would not get to do it, but everyone else would get to do crowd walla. <laughs> they would always tell me to stay quiet because they could hear me. They could tell it was me in the crowd walla. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Oh. watermelon. <laughs> uh, uh, Alexander, did you? I, I, the rules were different because you were six and seven, so uh, your time in the booth is probably limited to just a few hours a day. I know yeah. the grown-ups they can work a little longer, but uh, right. you must have gone um, in for what two hours, three hours at most. Yeah, two to three hours, and then you, as a child, you have to do a couple hours of school. My recording sessions usually consisted of like two or three days. Most of them I would go up to Pixar Animation Studios in, um, mm. in 
uh, the Bay Area, so it's yeah, the area, and um, it, which is a really really cool place. It kind of had that startup feel. I think it was one of the first companies to make like a startup feel kind of vibe. A lot of others, yeah, modeled off of them. Every, um, everybody's got their own crazy desk designs, and yeah, there's the, had, there's I, I've seen it documented the hidden rooms and all mm -hmm. that wackiness. Yeah, yeah, hidden rooms. Everyone's riding their scooters around everywhere. Um, <laughs> there's a little short on on the. Um, on the DVD set, I don't know where you can find it. I think you can find it somewhere online nowadays. Um, of me I, at seven or eight in my, I had Heelys, which were the little shoes with the wheels oh, on them, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, zooming around Pixar, asking people different questions about about their jobs there. And it was a really, it was a really fun experience for a kid. It kind of felt like going to Disneyland for work, which was, which was pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> seven when you did that. Yeah, so I started when I was six years old, and then it finished when I was nine. So it was like a three-year recording process. Wow. I started the business when I was eight, so I had the same experience as you with uh, getting tutored on the sets and everything. Yeah. And I was doing uh, a Starman. I it was like 13, and I was just wandering around like the Burbank back lot. Yeah. Uh, 13, well, yeah, it was in the 80s. Just wandering around a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah, just wandering around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like that. Yeah, yeah. There were there were not a lot of restrictions other than like you have to get your three hours of school in. Uh, yeah. yeah, gracious. What uh, what's been what's been your what's been a very, uh, a fond memory you've all taken from your experience in voicing these Disney characters? Um, Jump oh, ball, yeah. like, ladies, ladies first. We're all being polite. Yeah. Um, you want me to start? Okay, I'll start. Go ahead. Fond, a fond memory from my experience. Yeah. In Aladdin. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I'm gonna. I won't go back as far as Aladdin. I'm gonna go more recent. I had such incredible memories with the other princesses, and and we were really fortunate to be brought together into the same world for Ralph Breaks the Internet. So one of the most incredible things, and I think every single one of us that you'll talk to will reference this moment in our shared history. When we were at D23 in 2017, and they introduced the scene, we were a big secret. No one knew that we were in Ralph Breaks the Internet, mm -hmm. and they surprised the fans showed this like one scene that ended up being another scene as well, but they showed this scene of the princesses all together for the first time in one film. And then they brought us on stage one at a time, starting with Jody Benson. And at first the fans thought just Jody was there and they were so excited. And then Jody said, I'd like to introduce a dear friend of mine, the voice of Belle, Paige O'Hara. And Paige came out and they were like, oh, two princesses. Then Paige introduced me and they got it. The fans yeah. were on their feet. They were like, they're all coming. We were all there live on stage together. There were a couple of people missing from you know the movie, but I think there were 11 of us out of the 14. That's... And it was, it was, somebody said the other day, it, it felt like, we felt like the Beatles, the, the, enthusiasm, excitement from the crowd, the moment that we were in, we were like completely overwhelmed and and thrilled to be there and we'll never forget it. It was really, really exciting. So what? as great as we all, you know, feel our individual projects were, bringing all of us together is more powerful than, than any of us by ourselves. <clears throat> Pretty cool. Absolutely. And and you lived on the title that that scene, and when the buzz of that came out, it broke the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it, it literally did. It literally did. It's it, uh, and it's nothing against it, but people stopped talking about Wreck It Ralph too. They were like, "Oh, a Disney princess is on one team!" It was it was really great the way that they did it. The way they brought us all together was wow. And the nice thing I thought about it too was was I, I liked how in the Wreck-It Ralph sort of uh, universe that it created, it was like, okay, these are permutations of them outside of it. So right. if you want a little more, the, the more pure versions will say it that way too, but it, it worked both ways. It, it yeah, it was really fun. It was a, a really fun expansion of 
the characters that everyone knows and loves. And it was also really cool because several of us have been doing these conventions. So we've been doing these appearances. So that backstage scene where we're hanging out in the green room, you know, just being ourselves, <laughs> from real life, we have this history that we're growing together because of Comic-Cons, because we have this, you know, opportunity to go live to cities, to meet fans in person and to be together at different characters from different movies. Like Christopher and I have done several of these appearances together. Alexander, I haven't seen you on the road, but mm -hmm. I'm sure one day we will cross paths yeah. in person. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's my first, first time out, so. <gasps> Oh, to getting out in, in, oh, no. in the world. Yay! Okay, this is good. Indeed, yeah. indeed. So, uh, Alexander, that's uh, how's this? You have a favorite memory from from all this? Um, yeah, I think my favorite memory was was let's see, I have two. The the premiere of Nemo was mm -hmm. you know they threw this gigantic party. They had a like built a essentially a paper mache volcano that was like the size of a, a room inside this giant tent. And they had it like all bubbling out all night and just like chocolate fountains and so much, everything that it was everything that a kid could want. Yeah. <laughs> the time I was 10 years old and it was just, it was all fun and overwhelming for sure, but just, you know, fantastic. And my other favorite memory was just, all the experiences I had going to Pixar, which is just, just again, a super cool place. And um, just really um, neat to see all of the technology that they used and getting to see the animators do their thing um, was all, all really, really cool. I was always kind of into that stuff adjacently. So I was really fascinated to watch the process. And that, that's certainly something that, uh, that these two, I, don't think you guys ever like got a chance to walk around the animation studios of the guys at the drawing desk. Um, I think I did. We, really? Yeah, we. I, I do remember coming to Orlando and meeting with Mark Henn, who was the animator for Jasmine, and having a a pretty cool backstage tour of the animation studios where all the drawings were yes. happening. We spent a lot of time together during that process, which was so fortunate for me to be able to know the person that I'm sharing the role with. Because I, I always shared my role with the animator and with the singer, with Lea Salonga. Yeah. So, and we all got to know each other in that process. Mm -hmm. So we were really fortunate that way that at that time in Disney animation, they started to see the value of bringing all yes. of the components together during the process. That's that's good that yeah that they definitely showed Just, again the old system of hand drawing then the, everything was all layered but definitely you're at the beginning of the integration of it that uh, well that that formula works as we all know so yeah, I mean it's such a huge collaborative process uh, as all film is but animation in particular there are a lot of hands on deck and it's really. At least then, I, I think, you know, I don't know really how it is now with a lot of the computer technology, but back then it was really a lot of people physically doing the work. Oh, yeah. well, Alexander can tell you all about the cred, the computer stuff when his, yeah. his, was, uh, was, his, ro his, his, ro his role in your saddle. So, uh, mm -hmm. Chris Christopher, any, uh, any memory that stands out from your experience? Yeah, my, my favorite memories regarding my voiceover work, especially in, in Disney, is uh, it, it came subsequently uh, when people, because it, we didn't know what, what it was at the time. Yeah. Uh, and subsequently you realized, oh, you're part of a legacy. You're part of this this you know, this amazing thing. And uh, uh, subsequently when people would say to me things like, you know, you made my childhood better or, you know, Things like that really impacted me. Really made me feel uh, like the work meant something, and it just that that that's the best thing for me is when people say things. And, and with Spider Man too, people have said things like, you know, you helped me deal with getting bullied at school. I mean, things like that. So yeah. the work itself was great, and I have fond memories of, of you know actually doing the, the the job and being a part of it. But that's what really means the most to me is when people say how it impacted them, and uh, 
you know, that's, that's pretty awesome. Awesome indeed. And I think we're ready to go to some audience questions. So I'll ask Jude, our producer, to roll out our first one. And this comes from Alex. Uh, for everyone, ooh, what is your favorite Disney sidekick? Oh. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to say the most annoying Disney sidekick is my favorite Iago, because I have such a dear friend in Gilbert Gottfried, and he's just like such a big part of my heart. So I, I think he did a wonderful job with that character and really made him stand out in such a villainous way. And I just adore him. So he's my personal favorite sidekick, but I am a little biased. <laughs> Absolutely, but you are you are so allowed to, especially okay. I'm a Gilbert Godfrey fan, so I gotta go with it. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, any uh, favorite Disney sidekick? So, uh, apologies to both of you, but my, um, unfortunately, my favorite Disney movie when I was growing up, starting from the age of like two, was The Lion King. Uh, um, so yeah. I, I love Little Mermaid and Aladdin, obviously, but The Lion King <laughs> holds a special place in my heart. So it has to be P to Moon and Pumbaa. They're kind of that you can't have one with the out the other, so I count them that's both. Very, that's very. That's true. That's yeah. true. There, there you go. Yeah. You can't have Abbott without Costello. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I am my favorite Disney sidekick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You may not be wrong. Be wrong. Uh, I'm a Jiminy Cricket fan myself. I have fondness for the classics. So, Alex, thank you. Great question. Uh, let's do another one from Daniel. Uh, these films are likely a big part of our childhood. Uh, what were your favorite childhood films? Hmm. Well, Daniel, my favorite childhood film was probably The Sound of Music. My favorite, I love that movie so much. Um, and Julie Andrews, who I got to meet because of my connection to Disney as an adult. Scott Weinger and I were doing a talk show in New York in 2015, and Julie Andrews was a guest in another segment. And Scott and I were like, oh, can we meet Julie? We meet her, and we got to have a, a meeting backstage, and it was huge for me, having known her since I was a little girl, and for Scott too. I mean, everybody, she's just iconic. And because of our involvement with Aladdin, we got to meet one of our heroes. Um, in terms of animation, my trilogy of films when I was a little girl were Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty. So those are, you know, my classics. Nice. Mm -hmm. Those are those are very very worthy choices. Gentlemen, who. I, I think in terms of animation, probably, uh, like I said, I think The Great Mouse Detective. I just love The Great Mouse Detective. I love Rad. I, I watched that recently, and I just thought it's just it's just funny. It gets better with time because we see things as an adult you didn't see as a kid. Um, and you oh, can't go wrong with Vincent Price. And you, you just <laughs> so genius. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I think probably Star Wars. Probably those were the films that, that as a kid growing up, that probably impacted me the most in terms of the mythic you know, art kind of swirling around in there. Yeah. Nice, very nice. So, and how about you, young man? Um, yeah, I, so I said Lion King just a minute ago, but um, I was also still like a teenager when the Marvel films all started coming out. So those were definitely hugely impactful for the last, I guess, 15 years or something. So um, those are definitely a, a, a high point. They always came out on like May 4th, which is my birthday. Or right yeah. around. So yeah. Like, the nice Star Wars, May the Fourth Be With You, and then I would get like a Marvel film, and there's a whole bunch of fandom happening around them. Which is That's great. <laughs> nice. They did it just for you. Yeah, just for right. me. Right. It's all our birthday present. Daniel, great question. Uh, Jude, what do you have next? From Linda. Oh, okay. How was your experience voicing? Okay. Uh, to and I believe. I believe, uh, Christopher, you've uh, gone back and done some Kingdom Hearts yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. So uh, what was it like to anybody who returned to the character uh, in, in video game format uh, of doing your character again? 
Uh, and okay, and I see the second part of that question too, has your portrayal of her voice changed over the years? The answer to that is no. There's a whole department at Disney that is, is called Disney Character Voices. And the whole mission of that department is to keep these characters true to their original form. So when we do a new project like Kingdom Hearts, we we do it with Disney character voices in the room, in in the headsets. And if there's anything that they're asking us to do for this particular product or project that doesn't seem like it's part of Jasmine's world or something that Jasmine would say or a way that she would say it, we all have a voice in expressing that and keeping it true to the original. Um, working on Kingdom Hearts in particular was a challenging, exciting, but challenging project because the amount of material that we had to record for Kingdom Hearts was more than we had to record for the original movies. Yes. It was it was massive and and took several recording sessions because you can only do so much in one day before your voice starts to get tired and you need to rest and don't talk to anybody when you go home and come back the next day and, and be fresh and strong. So I loved working on those projects. I loved the team that came over from Japan. I remember very specifically being in the room together and and having a really unique experience and people love that game i get kingdom hearts covers when i'm at comic cons all the time they they come through and i'm like oh my gosh i i love seeing that because people you know really are devoted to the game <laughs> absolutely Anybody else do when they when they return to the character? Uh, either, yeah, either Kingdom Hearts or at any point. It's dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's dead. You become very protective of the character, uh, and it, it because you realize that it's more than about you. You're just the you're the avatar. You're the incarnation of this this archetype that means so much to other people, and so you have to be very you, know, you want to be you want to be respectful of that. And uh, and you know you, when you, she she's right when you go to the booth they'll give you uh, here's a reference. So you're listening to yourself and you're listening to things and you put yourself in that mindset. And, you know, so yeah, everything went so, so I have a little bit of a unique experience here because when I was about 13 years old, I got a phone call that said, uh, you can't, you can't do this voice anymore. Your, your voice has changed. And as you can hear right now, I, I don't really sound like Nemo. So um, it's, it's really interesting to hear your experiences of, of going back and having to kind of stay true to that character because um, it would be it would be awesome if I was able to, but I, I haven't had that experience, so I didn't even know that was uh, something that happened. So that's really fast. Pretty soon, I think we're all gonna get that phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so that's so interesting. Yeah, I didn't even think about that, Alexander, because as a child, you really you really do go through that. Yeah, grow out of it. Yeah. But the great thing is that your performance is forever. Yeah, it lives on it lives on beyond me, which is really cool. And you probably still I don't know I don't know if you do. This happens for me sometimes where they'll lift something from mm -hmm. other source material. So I'll be, yeah. you know, in a new project or in a new something or other at one of the parks, but it's a line I recorded in the past. Yeah, I think both of the Nemo rides at um at Orlando and Los Angeles Disneyland both have my voice lifted from the film. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, well, then, forever and ever. Yeah. Well, then let, let me ask you this, Alexander, because I don't want to leave you out of this question. Uh, mm -hmm. When uh, tell us a little bit about Bambi. Bambi, yeah. Um, so that was that was maybe two or three years after I did Nemo. Um, I did Bambi two, and that was interesting because I was actually voice matching the original Bambi. So, That's what I mean. You had to later listen to the voice. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I would listen to the voice. And um, yeah, focus on finding the right voice. I'm not exactly sure what I did, but I, I guess I did it well enough to be in the film. And the same thing happened for the for Finding Dory. Um, Nolan, who um, I think his name is Nolan, who played Nemo in the um, in Finding Dory, had to do that with with my voice. So um, I'm kind of aware of that 
being a thing, but well, you you are you are Nemo Prime, so yeah. that's the important thing. And you, and, 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 and Susie Lum sits down with somebody and says, "It's got to sound like this." They're always going to be listening to you. Yeah, so you leave, <laughs> usually got that. So, oh, great question. Thank you. What do we have next from Haley? Uh, what were your favorite scenes from your movie? I will. I'll start. My favorite scene is the magic carpet ride, and it starts, we go into that with dialogue and we come out of it with dialogue. So I do feel very much a part of it. Um, even though it's not me singing, it it truly, that scene in the animated film soars. To me, that is what animation is all about. There are no limits. You can take it anywhere. And these characters were able to take a ride around the world in a very, believable way and and that just transported me that scene and and brought me as a viewer to another place and i just always loved it i have other favorites for other reasons but today that's that's the one that comes to my mind certainly i would say probably uh part of your world in little mermaid because it is uh it's such an iconic moment in the film but uh i think it's also one of the best sequences in disney history uh, i just think it's a beautiful beautiful sequence and also because it's it's so universal to the human condition it's a, it's the archetype of the, the the coming of age story i mean it's everybody can relate to that and, you know mm -hmm. what it's all about and that's what the movie's about coming of age and finding who you are and and uh and not being deceived to being who you think you should be and all that. So it's a lot of the hero's journey. I think it's a beautiful sequence. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 that that scene's always stood out to me for that reason too. And um, yeah, um, in Nemo, I think it's, it's kind of a similar theme. I, I really uh, love the scene where Nemo kind of defies what he's been told and steps out of his comfort zone and goes to touch the boat out in the, the open ocean and it, kind of has negative consequences in the short term, but um, it ends up creating this whole journey for him and his father and and they have to, yeah, it, it's, but that, that's really that moment of Nemo like making a stand and also kind of taking that step off the edge is also kind of archetypal in, in that way. It, it, it's, um, it's fascinating how they all kind of play on those themes, but um, yeah, it's, it's a- it's, I thought we were talking about these movies 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, however many years later. Yeah. Because they address the human condition. And yeah. that's what great art does. And that's what great stories do. Because people yeah. a thousand years from now are going to be able to relate to jumping off the edge. Yeah. Right. I mean, Absolutely. that's what it means to be human. You know, it's time to move to the next level and go through these, you know, psychological right. processes, you know. Yeah. Overcome things. Right. Making choices for yourself. That was, that was something that Jasmine goes through where she's being told what to do and, who to marry and how to behave as a female. And she she takes a stand and, and says, how dare you, all of you, standing around deciding my future. She's, she really actively says, I will choose. I'm gonna marry for love. I'm not gonna marry who you tell me to marry. And you know, that's pretty cool for a 16 year old. You know, like really, it's really, what we all need to do. I think yeah. it's our own moral compass and decide the lives that we're going to live. I, I think one of the things I like about um, uh, about The Little Mermaid and, and Jody's portrayal and, and the story is that here you have a story where literally the young woman is told, you can't have a voice. <laughs> your value, you don't have value. Like your value is you don't need a voice because you have your looks, your pretty face. So you don't need your voice. I mean, wow, what a message to send to women, young women go, no, don't take that deal. <laughs> That's not the right deal. Anybody that tells you that, you know, no, not okay. So right. Yeah, absolutely. Say, Haley, thank you for that. Good one. And a reminder to our audience, if you would like to chat with our panelists like I am now, purchase an autograph or get a personalized recorded message, please sign up right now at galaxycon.com. And Jude, let's do another one. And this comes from Marianne. What advice would you give your characters? 
And what advice would they give to you? Oh, that's good. Somebody else start. I have to uh, think about this one. Uh, I'll say, uh, Ariel, when you're going into Ursula's Grotto, just look at all those little shriveled, terrified <laughs> people that have made the deal. Don't, don't make the deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that That's good. That's good advice. <laughs> um, I think the advice I'd give, give to Nemo is to, I guess, um, just continue fighting to be yourself and be an individual and embrace your, your differences. And I'm sure the advice that he would give me, which is definitely good advice in, in all cases, is just keep swimming. Uh, <laughs> That's good. That's really keep, good. Keep on keeping on. That's kind of a mantra for me. So keep going. Yeah. yeah. Good. Very I think good. that I think Jasmine would give me better advice than I would give her. She just seems to really have it together. She really knows her mind and and really knows the right thing to do at the right moment. I I feel like the advice that she could give me is to believe in myself and to have confidence and strength in my convictions, which I do and I strive for, but I think Jasmine does it better. And I, I really look to that character sometimes and, and think it's something we have in common, but it, it's something that she does better in her life than I do in mine. So I would take that example from her to believe in myself. Our heroes are always better versions of ourselves. Right? right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Marianne, thank you. That was a good one. Really good yeah. question. Thank you, Marianne. And what's next? From Sorcerer Beth. Ah, <laughs> do fans ever recognize your voice when you are just doing normal things? 100%. Yes. I, I have a, a story that I shared at D23 last summer. I was on my way there. I was at JFK in the waiting area to get on the plane. And there was a guy standing maybe, oh, 20 feet away from me. And he was like, are you Linda Larkin? And I was like, what? He goes, are you Linda Larkin? I was like, oh, yeah. Do we know each other? Because I'm in New York. I, I know a lot of people. I thought maybe it's, you know, maybe he worked at my vet or, you know, I know him from the gym, I don't know. And and he was like, you're Princess Jasmine. I was like, yes, I am. How did you know that? He goes, I recognized your voice. I heard you talking to your husband and I recognized your voice. And then I looked you up online to see if it was really you. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is good. That's someone with a good ear because in a, a loud ambient environment like that, he pinpointed my voice like that. Mm, but it happens to me all the bad. time. It ha like people will like whip around and look at me, and they'll be like, "Do I do I know you?" I'm like, "Yeah, you <laughs> probably do." It <laughs> with Spider Man, not with Prince Eric. It happens to me with Spider Man. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost always uh, guys who it's basically young men or you know guys who grew up watching Spider Man that demographic who they they recognize my voice. Very often, but <laughs> dude, are you Iron Man? Yeah, exactly. You're not Spider Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you my? Are you my Spider Man? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've had the experience for years of of just being recognized because of, of uh, the television show Weeds that I was on. Um, so that would happen, but then every once in a while, I would get someone who would be like. Are you Nemo? And I, it would catch me off guard because I, I didn't really know how they knew that, didn't really connect that they were like probably looking me up online somewhere, but they'd pick that that out and wouldn't even mention um, the show that I was on, which which is what I was used to getting recognized yeah. for. So it was kind of a funny um, dual di dichotomy uh, between those two that that sometimes happened. <laughs> did any of you ever do uh somebody called it the street surprise where you just maybe saw somebody with a t-shirt or playing with the figures and go oh so you like that character yeah you know i do the voice you know did you ever oh, did you ever, have you ever outed yourselves okay yes 
this happened to me last year at Disneyland. There was a little girl who had a lavender, um, like, shiny jacket that said Jasmine 92 on it. And I was like, oh, that's so cute, Jasmine 92. That's obviously a mention to the 92 film. And she was at the Wishing Well by Cinderella's castle at Disneyland. She was with her parents. She's probably oh, wow. three years old. And I was walking by with my family. We were just spending a few hours there. I was there working later in the day. But I was with a, a guide. And the guide saw the little girl. And he said, oh, I bet she's here to meet Jasmine. And Jasmine isn't coming today. He said, would you, would you mind saying hello to her? And I was like, oh, no, absolutely. So he went over to the family and he said, are you, are you here to see Jasmine, who is scheduled to be there at 10 o'clock? And they were like, yes. And he said, I'm sorry, Jasmine had to go back to Agrabah. She's not going to be here today. And the little girl's face dropped. The parents said the whole reason we came to Disneyland was because she wanted to meet Jasmine. And the guide said, well, we have a special treat. This is Princess Jasmine from the original movie. And she would like to say hi to you. Is that OK? And the little girl lit up. And you know she's three. So I don't think she really connects the voice to the character. But they believe they can yeah. go there when they're three years old. And, and their imaginations can capture that. And, and she got to meet Jasmine oh. at the wishing yeah. well as planned. So that was one of the few times that I've stepped forward and said, yes, that's me. That's awesome. That's, that's very, yeah, that's very sweet. That's and very sweet. Guides, the people at Disneyland in the plaid vests who you see walking through the park sometimes, they are so gifted at making every moment special for the people in the park. I've seen them like, take baby ducks off the walk and get them into the grass and, and make a magical moment for this little girl who was there to see Jasmine when Jasmine, you know, had called in that day. Yeah. So it, it was, it, they're, they're really pretty incredible and I can't wait for them to get back to work for those parts to open again. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Sorcerer Beth, thank you. That was a great question. And thank you for sharing that story, Linda. That was really nice. We have time for one more question, so I'll ask you to pull out a really good one for us. And this comes from Jessica. What part of your characters are most like you? Uh, hmm. I'll, I'll go. I um, <laughs> So in the process of making animated films in general, they, they'll do a video camera, I think we might have talked about it a little bit earlier, do a video camera on you um, while you're filming. So Nemo had these big giant eyes and that was what I had when, when I was young. I, my eyes are still pretty big, but when I was that young, they were these giant brown eyes and they captured those in Nemo like perfectly, which was really, really cool. Nice. Well, let's see, uh, I don't know, heroic, princely, brave, willing to defend the woman he loves. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nothing. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> I wouldn't be all those wonderful things. Yeah, well, you know, you live up to be a hero. You, you do your best. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sell yourself, sorry. You're still a handsome man with, uh, with, with a good... <clears throat> now you've got a seafaring countenance, which makes makes sense, you know. I, it's, but I'm King Eric now. And so they'll they'll put the, that picture that actually is on the screen right now. They'll, they'll put one up there uh, like that. And what I do is I take a... Uh, I take a gray marker and I just draw the beard. <laughs> King Eric on it. I'm King Eric now. <laughs> that makes sense. So, uh, how about you, young lady? Um, um, for Jasmine, I think that Jasmine is a bit of an activist, and and that is very true to my heart as well. Jasmine fought for a big change in a marriage law in 1992 in Agrabah and you know 25 years later it happened for real in the United States and I, I really felt like Jasmine would have been proud of that moment in our lives as I was proud of that moment in Jasmine's life she you know is a very passionate and loyal person and and follows her her heart and her own moral compass 
not what she's been told is right and wrong, but what she knows in her heart is right and wrong. And that's something I think that we really have in common. I agree. I agree. GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with a cast of these Disney classics, but it does not have to be yours. If you'd like to chat with our panelists, purchase an autograph, or get a personalized recorded message, please head over to GalaxyCon.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out our schedule of upcoming events, just like this one. Thank you so much for joining us today, panelists. Any final words for our audience before we go? Thank you for being here. It was really, really wonderful to do this and to have an opportunity to be with Alexander, with Christopher, and with Patty. Patty, you did such a great job. Thank you. And wonderful questions. I just wish you all well. It's always great to do these and to be a part of this. And, and uh, it's, it's just a big Disney family, so it's, it's wonderful. Thank you for, for still appreciating the work, because we do. Yeah. It was really, really wonderful to be a part of this. Really great to meet you, Linda and, and Christopher and Patty. Thank you so much um, for everything. And um, yeah, just peace and love to everyone. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for those great questions. And we hope to see you again tomorrow night, Monday, for a Rock Around the Ring Tuesday with Galaxy Con Talks Comics. And we have a lot of guests and experiences like this next weekend. Happy Father's Day. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care and keep washing those hands. <laughs>